Okay, so thank you everyone for uh, making it this uh, morning or noon for you. For you, uh, it's a bit early here in Montreal, but uh, I wanted to try to make it uh, as early as possible to to be able to accommodate the you know the European uh, customer base. Um, so today we're really going to tackle something a bit more niche in terms of uh, on wafer load pull. Uh, we've talked about more broader. Um, you know topics like the introduction to load pool and uh, you know some waveform engineering topics. So uh, to do this today, we we uh, you know asked our our partner MPI Corporation and uh, Dr. Andre Rumansiev. Uh, hopefully, I, I did that not too bad. Uh, to to help us out, uh, you know, on on certain aspects of calibration, probing, uh, and and some uh, deeper um, you know technical uh, topics that uh, that that a lot of people you know, I think take for granted and, you know, don't appreciate the, the, the effort that needs to go into to, to getting uh, good results. So uh, it's going to be a two session um, uh, webinar where I'll cover some of the, my topics first and then uh, Andre will, will cover the, uh, the, the second part. So uh, let's just get started. So the agenda, again, uh, you know, uh, we're going to go over, you know, basic things at the beginning, just local setups, lim limitation of tuning ranges, uh, typical on wafer setup, you know, uh, and we're the typical all wafer setups will cover like sub six gigahertz, you know, the 5G, you know, sub six gigahertz and millimeter wave is really popular now. So we'll take a look at those stuff and even 110 gigahertz setup. Um, and then Andre will pick up the you know the puck there and, and uh, cover different things again parts of calibration S parameter measurements and things like that uh, in in a more thorough way. So again, a load pull setup. So okay, we we've had a few webinars on this, so we've covered these topics a bit. So it's going to be a very quick overview. Uh, you know. I get, this is usually how things happen for me. I get a call from a customer or from MPI and they say like, oh, uh, you know, we have this opportunity where we want to, you know, put uh, this great product of, a car, a product of ours, uh, you know, our probe station and they want to match it with one of your great products. And, you know, at the end we need to figure out how this big tuner can mate on, on a probe station like this. So yes, individually, these products are great and, and, and very popular and, uh, you know, uh, they're really, you know, we're really proud of these, but the problem is to make these things to work seamlessly together is not as easy as it seems, you know. Uh, it's bulky tuners, you have microscope, RF probes, DC pins, there's a lot that goes into it. And, uh, you know, really, really have to, to take a lot of effort to do it right and, and to, 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 to basically keep the performance as is once, once you, you, you migrate from like a fixture measurement to non wafer measurement. So I want to give a quick example. So this is more of a fixtured measurement, right? Where, uh, you know, here's one of our uh, application engineers, uh, Tim. Uh, this was probably four or five years ago. Uh, we were doing this demonstration in, in, a, in a hotel room. And as you can see, he's all excited. You know, he's, he's ready to go. Very simple setup. You know, you have a table, you have a few longer cables, you know, you could accommodate. Very simple setup, you know, fixtured measurement. You know, yes, there's some, you know, expertise that needs to go into the fixturing of it, you know, like transformation fixtures and biasing, you know, things like that. But usually that's pretty a pretty simple way to connect and set up everything. Mechanically, everything, you know, sets up seamlessly. The size of the tuner is not really a problem. This is what it looks like when you're not prepared and you go to an on wafer, you know, demo or a setup. And this, so this is an example of one. So, so all these setups that are not good are basically setups that I was part of. So I could, I could show them and I, <laughs> this is basically what I'm trying to show you is what not to do. So as you can see now, this setup, we're trying to set it up on a probe station and you can see here, this is a mess. You know, there's a right angle connector. There's a, it's a, it's a, not a low loss cable. There's all sorts of cables, you know, we're using the, the tuner as the mouse pad, you know, this was not poorly planned and we we're just trying to try to get some measurements done, but clearly, you know, this is, this is not the recipe for success. And you can look at the, even Nevin's face. So you can see that he's not happy. This is going to be a, a, a difficult situation, right? So the last one example is another, this is a noise system. Again, there's some DC probes, uh, 90 degree you know, probes, not easy to integrate. This is a small tuner. And even this takes a lot of time and effort to, to, to look into. So you know, this will give you, you, know, you look at this cable that's basically connecting from the tuner to the probe. It's awkward, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's bent, it's, it's in a weird shape. This is not a, a, a recipe for success, right? 
So in the end, what are we looking for? You know, we're looking for stable, repeatable contact. Okay. Uh, you know, the tuner works well on itself. The probe station works well on itself, but if the tuner's moving and there's some vibration in the tuner, vibration in the cable and it connect and it translates to the probe, it's going to be a, a problem. You know, we're looking at micrometers here. You want the probe tip to land correctly on the, on the pads, on the device so that you could calibrate you know, uh, accurately, and that you can measure accurately. If you have a one pin that's in the air that's not, you know, landing right, or it's kind of landing too, or it's moving, there's oxidation. This is a nightmare. So, so this is something that 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 takes some some time, and you know, integration on a probe station is a big thing. Okay, so, you know. When you get a brand new through, you know, you're all excited, everything's clean, you know, that it's a it's a perfect start. You know, this is what you know the pads or the the uh, the probe uh, marks of uh, you know of, let's say you want to do S parameters because the S parameter measurement you're basically lifting the probes up and down you're landing you don't need to dig in too hard uh, you know and it's a measurement that doesn't need to sit there for a very long time uh, load pull is a very different thing you know you need to sit down on the pro on the on the on the substrate for a very long time. So here's an example of, you know, like a poor calibration where the, 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 the probe tips are actually moving on the input and on the output. So you see that we're slightly damaging the, the, the substrate at this point, and, and that will have an effect in the long term. Okay. So here, you know, once, you know, most of the time what we do is the source tuner, we do a bit of source tuning just to kind of get in the right area, but then we do a lot of load pull and then we do a lot of movements and then, you know, it, it, it starts chewing up the, the through. So this is something that we see, you know, unfortunately on systems that, you know, were not poorly, were poorly uh, managed and not necessarily well integrated, you know, so a lot goes into, uh, you know, putting this so that the tuners are very close to the, the probe tips and allow to, uh, you know, the greater tuning range, but all, uh, also allow minimum vibration, right? So uh, if somebody's attended the introduction to load pool uh, webinar, we had this is, I have two slides, it's basically the introduction. So here, basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to control the A wave. So the, the wave that we're reflecting back to the device. So there's different ways of doing this. Either you do it with a passive tuner, you would do it with an active tuner where you're just injecting the, the A wave, or you could do a combination of both. Today, we're going to really focus on the passive version of it, okay? So again, we're focusing on this A wave. The DUT will generate the B wave, and then the load that we're going to be use, uh, using will basically be reflecting that A wave, and that's what we're trying to control here. So again, for passive tuners, the way we do it is, you know, we inject the B wave that goes through the tuner. This is when the tuner is initialized. So if we put the, 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 the RF probe that's in the tuner and it's totally retracted, what happens is the B wave just goes through and that's like a 50 ohm match. It's a very good match. So in other words, you're, you're not, you know, tuning out you know, on, on the outer rings of the smith chart. You're basically tuning at 50 ohms. But as we, you know, bring the probe down, uh, and you inject the same B wave, well now, and, you know, depending on what position you are, you're reflecting that wave back, and that now you'll have a component in the A wave, and that's how you basically create, uh, you know, the impedances and, and control it over the Smith chart, okay? So we'll talk about how we do this within the, the tuners here. So the big thing with passive tuners is, you know, is the tuning range limitation. You know, a passive tuner will not be able to go outside the Smith chart like an active system. So you're limited, you know, at the tuner reference plane, you're limited, you know, within the Smith chart. Now, as you add loss, add a cable, adapter, or probe, this will limit the tuning range, okay? So again, at the tuner reference plane, on the right, you see the, the, the gray area is basically covering most of the Smith chart. And you'll see, you know, specifications on tuners at uh, the tuner reference plane, they're, they're very high. They could be high frequency, low frequency. Uh, you know, we have these waveguide tuners that go up to 110. Uh, they are, you know, extremely high tuning range. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, you still need to connect it to a device. So even if you have a 30 to 1, 50 to 1, VSWR, the tuning range, that doesn't mean much uh, until you actually put something to connect to the device, right? So you know, the DUT reference plane, or, you know, it could be a cable reference plane, but basically, you know, our DUT reference plane will change depending on how we connect tuner to the device. And basically what we're doing here is we're adding some electrical length, so a cable or probe within the tune, between the tuner and the device. So what will that do? 
as we increase the electrical length between the tuner and the device, we increase the insertion loss. So we add insertion loss, therefore, you know, uh, limiting or, you know, diminishing the tuning range of the tuner. So again, as we, you know, you've seen here now that the tuning range is less because we moved away from the, the tuner reference plane. As I move away further, the tuning range goes even less. Right. So the further, the longer the cable, uh, you know, the, the more probes, the more adapters, the bias T couplers, whatever you put in there, the more you add, the less tuning range you'll get. OK, so this is an obvious thing. Um, so now people will say, OK, so I just need to have like a very low loss cable and a low loss probe and it should be pretty straightforward. But there's more to it than that. So uh, here we'll give an example, you know, the T50 Pro, but we use quite a bit. You know, we, we love this kind of probe. It's very durable. Uh, you know, for load pull, we, we do multiple contacts. We, we do measurements for a very long time. So one of the main things is durability, but, you know, then there's insertion loss. So, again, if you look at insertion loss here, this is the tuning range, again, of a, of a tuner. But if we look at, you know, just past 30 gigahertz, the, uh, the insertion loss is about 0.4 dB. So we know that that's going to reduce the tuning range a bit, right? So now I'm exaggerating a bit, but just to kind of explain just the, the concept. So basically the insertion loss will, you know, reduce the radius of this tuning range, okay? That's the first thing you need to look in, uh, you know, you look at insertion loss as low as possible. That's a, that's a very important thing. The next important thing that a lot of people take for granted is the return loss. So you see here the, the, the center point of this tuning range is at 50 ohms, okay? But now depending on what frequency, if you look at the lower uh, plot, that's the return loss of the probe. So, you know, you can see here that this, this probe is really good, you know, across the entire frequency range below 20 dB. Uh, but 20 dB is still 0.1 uh, gamma. So, you know, at certain frequencies, let's say we look at, you know, a specific frequency here, like around 33, 32, 33 gigahertz, you can see that we're at minus 20 dB. So how does that translate into the tuning range? You know, people will say, no, it's only insertion loss that's going to reduce it. But what happens is now the center is going to be offset. So instead of being 50 ohm, it's going to be slightly offset to 0.1 at a certain phase. And that's something you cannot correct for with the tuner. So what's going to happen now is that tuning range circle is going to be shifted in cer a certain area of the Smith chart. And now you can't compensate. If you're lucky and your, 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 uh, your impedance is on the right side or it's going north, then, you know, you're fine. Then, uh, then that's actually helping you. In, in, in this case, it's acting a bit like a pre-match. But in my experience, most of the time, the probes is in the right, wrong area, you know, especially at the low frequency. Because at low frequency, uh, you know, it doesn't turn as quickly. And the phase is, uh, you know, it's depending on, on what position you are. Usually, you're going to be on the right side and the impedances are going to be on the left side. At 30, you know, 20, 30, 40 gigahertz, well, you know, then you could get different responses. And sometimes it could be on the left side. Sometimes it could be on the right side. It really depends in this case. But, uh, but that's something to, to, to look into. You know, a lot of people underestimate or, or don't, don't uh, appreciate the return loss uh, aspect of a pro when choosing a pro. Okay. So again, what affects tuning range? We've talked about insertion loss. So this is, you know, the typical vector uh, load pull setup where you have your tuner, a coupler, a cable, and a pro. Okay, so what happens here is we'll basically, you know, look at the, again, the tuner, the, 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 the tuning range of the, um, uh, of the, at the tuner reference plane is very high. But again, as we move away from this uh, reference plane, the, the tuning range is, is reducing. We'll see that before. So now you've reduced it because of the coupler. So now you have to add a, a cable. Once you've added the cable, you know, we're, you're reducing it again. Again, I'm exaggerating a bit the, the phenomenon, but if you're measuring at 30 gigahertz, you will get these kind of reduced uh, tuning ranges. And again, the probe will also add that. And again, finally, you'll add something even at the end, you'll add a, a termination. So you'll add a bias T, you can have an isolator, you can have something on the output of the tuner, and that will also shift the tuner in a certain, or the tuning range on a certain side. So you can see that in this case, now I had great tuning range at the tuner reference plane, but on certain areas of the Smith chart, I don't really get that great of a tuning range. So these are things that really need to be looked at seriously when, when, when you do on way for load pull, okay? Phase stable cable. So, you know, I have people that say, well, I'll just put a very phase stable cable. You know, I shouldn't worry about it. Or, or some people say, no, no, I just want the shortest cable as possible. 
But here I, I took an example of Gore. So Gore has, you know, uh, very, very good cables. We use them a lot and a lot of our customers have them. And, uh, but I wanted to look a bit on the spec. So here, if you look at the lower line here, there's some specifications and the typical phase stability is something is what we're really looking for. Uh, we're looking, uh, to, 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 to optimize. So, uh, I'm not going to talk about tuner calibration, but really quickly, you know, when you calibrate the tuner, obviously you do a coax calibration and then you want the, the, the cables to be very stable Then you connect it to the tuner. So you're looking for this, you know, plus or minus two degrees of stability. Okay. So, so, but if you're not careful and you use like this OM version of cable, now you can have, uh, you know, plus or minus 15 degrees. So plus or minus two degrees at like 18 gigahertz, you know, that that's still decent, but that's still not nothing. And, but plus or minus 15, you're talking about like 20, 30 degrees. So you can be 20, 30 degrees off of your impedance. That's a, that's a huge, um, you know, phase shift if you're not careful. Now, okay, there's a bit of, there's a caveat. It says when the cable is wrapped 360 degrees, you know, and in our case in local, you know, we never wrap it around 360 degrees, but it just gives you like the, the margin of error you, you could face if, if you're not careful. So how does that translate into tuner calibration and impedance presentation? So uh, here's an example of a tuner with like a gray cable, like a very, you know, this is a cable that we're, we're using and we're just calibrating the tune at this reference plane. So somebody that's used a tuner before, you have basically these tuning, these uh, impedance points across the Smith chart. So when you calibrate the tuner, you create this table of S parameters and you associate these X, Y positions to the tuner to these sets of F S parameters, right? So when you have the tuner calibrated and you use it after, so you, this calibration needs to be very uh, accurate and cannot change. So in other words, when I go to a certain impedance point or a different X, Y position in the tuner, you know, I assume that this point is going to be good and it won't change. So the problem is if I have a cable, so now if I change this cable from a very straight rigid cable and I put like this you know, flexible cable or I start bending the cable, what I can see is like, you know, the, the points have shifted. So this is like a two degree phase shift. So now you can see the red crosses are off what the original points were. So now when you start measuring, your impedance is off 2%. So, you know, this, depending on how accurate you want and, you know, how, how far you can push this, but now, you know, and th this could be seen when you do a match verification later. So then when you start shifting these points, well, you're trying to set a certain impedance, but you're actually somewhere else. So that's 2%. Now, if I bend it a bit more, and trust me, we've bent a lot of cables through the years. And so now this is a 15 degree space shift. Okay. So now you're totally off. Now you're like literally, you know, you know, 50 15 degrees off of your initial point. So near 50 ohms, you don't seem to be so far off. It doesn't seem to be so bad. You're still 15 degrees off, but the, the magnitude is, is, is not as much. So, but if you're looking, you know, you're looking, you know, at um, a very uh, small impedance, you have a very, very big uh, impedance shift. And this is going to be a problem in, in, in the long run. So, at sub six gigahertz, it's, you know, I would say it's less of a problem because again, you know, at low frequency, the, the, the wavelength is longer. So the electrical length uh, is shorter and it's, um, it's, it's, it's less of a problem. But here's an example um, of, of a system here. This is a, you know, 0.8 to eight. And uh, so there's two, two flavors of this tuner. And you can see on the top here, there's a 0.8 to 18 gigahertz tuner. And there's uh, that one is probably like a 10 to uh, 26 uh, gigahertz tuner. But basically what it's showing, there's these rigid air lines. So some customers, you know, say, I don't want the, the, the cable or the impedance to change whatsoever. So I need a rigid air line between the tuner and the probe tip, even if it's at low frequency. So to accommodate this, you, you need, you need to, to, to move the tuner basically. Now you can't just use a small positioner to move the probe because even when you do move that, even though the tuner is fixed and you actually move the probe, well there is, even if it's micrometers, you're still moving a bit, you know, you do a calibration, you need to do a, a TRL calibration, so you need to open it up for a delay line. So you're, you're moving, you know, the device has a different, you know, pad uh, distance. So, you know, you're still moving that probe tip a bit and the more you move it, the, the, the more it will introduce in uncertainty and phase error, you know. So here's an example again on, on, uh, on, uh, on in the middle here and at the bottom where the tuner is actually residing directly on the positioner. So, but we'll, we'll show that more into detail after. 
Okay. So again, here the, this is the full system. So again, the uh, you know we wanted the best tuning range as possible. So you see, both tuners have rigid air lines that go directly from the tuner to the probe tip. So you connect the probe tip directly to the tuner, and then you know you use these positioners. So there's a more zoomed in version here. So you can see here there's four knobs. So there's an X Y Z position, and there's a theta position as well. So you know one of the, the not problems, but one of the, the concerns with a, a rigid systems like this is when you sit down the tuner and you fix the probe, it's not going to be necessarily planarized perfectly. So you need to have a theta adjustment to actually move that, the, the tuner. So here, you know, as an example, the tuner, this is a you know, heavy tuner, this is over 50 pounds, is sitting on this heavy duty positioner where you can move it X, Y, Z and theta as well. And you, you get the, the best of both worlds. You get the best tuning range and you basically get the phase, uh, very stable, rigid line that doesn't move and provides the you know, most accurate measurement. Okay. So at high, at low frequency, like I said, you know, the, the tuners are big, wavelengths are long. So it's, you know, there is a bit of a, a margin for error. But as you go higher in frequency, you know, customers say, well, you know, this cable, I don't care what cable, as, it could be as good as you want. 30 gigahertz, as soon as I move anything, uh, you know, I get a phase error and then my calibration's off, my match verification's off. So how can I do this? So I remember four years ago, we had an internal meeting where we said, well, it's easy, just eliminate the cable. But as you've seen, you know, the tuners are big and it's not simple, you know, it's not that simple. So, you know, we can't just flip the tuner around and say, okay, connect it like that. You know, it, the, the, the tuner is slightly bulky. There's a, there's a, um, you know, there's a microscope, there's some DC, there's all sorts of things that are going to kind of conflict here. So removing the cable was not that simple, you know, and here's our first attempt at the Delta tuner. So clearly, you know, we were trying to get the tuner very close and then we had a small cable to get the best tuning range and we had this very, you know, precise uh, book and, you know, we're just, we're, we're just trying to get the tuner as close as possible. But clearly, this is not a feasible solution. So we, we, we had to find a way to really, uh, you know, reduce the size of the, the mechanics inside the tuner to provide, you know, you know accurate results and connect directly to the, to the probe tip. So... Here's a snapshot of the two, you know, the traditional tuner on the right. Again, the, this, you know, I would say four or five years ago, we were very proud of this tuner. This is a 10 to 67 two frequency tuner and had a rigid airline. But again, you see that the tuning range, the, the tuning probe is actually at the, at the window plane. So even if it's a, it's a very low loss rigid airline, the tuning range is reduced significantly. Okay, so customers needed, you know, higher tuning range. They needed, you know, 0.8 gamma at high frequencies. They couldn't deal with like 0 0.7, 0 0.6 gamma. They, they needed more. So on the left, you can see this is the same tuner. Um, so the, sorry, this is the fundamental version on the left, but it's, it's so it's the same size as the, as the harmonic tuners, basically. And, and as you can see now, the tuning probe is, you know, uh, an inch away from the probe. Uh, so, so that makes the tuning range drastically higher. So now in this case, we've reduced the cable, uh, you know, we reduced the need for a coupler as well. So it's really, really, you know, the, the best uh, tuning range performance you can get out of a passive tuner for on wafer performance. Okay. So what does it look like for millimeter waves? So we've uh, integrated a lot of, uh, you know, 10 to 67 to up to 110. Uh, the top uh, pictures probably our most popular one that we've had just through the past two three years. Uh, you know, from 10 to 50, 10 to 67. Um, on the right, you have uh, you know even uh, 28 to 110 gigahertz. So uh, you know we have customers now that want to push. You know, that do some advanced waveform engineering, like not only at uh, with one frequency uh, tuning, they want to do like multiple frequency tuning. Look at the waveforms and see how when you move the harmonics on both the input and output, how the waveforms change and how to, to design amplifiers with using uh, that kind of technology. So, uh, you know, we were able to, 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 to provide solutions like this from, you know, from the 28 to 110 with multiple frequency tuning on wafer, very well integrated uh, with MPI with their positioners as well. And, you know, on the right, you also see the key side head. It's just peeking out there. So it's very well integrated. You get the best performance, super accurate, very phase stable and, and, and reliable uh, contact. Okay, here's, uh, you know, probably one of the most uh, advanced low pull setups in the world. Uh, you know, this is, again, the roughly 
24, maybe 28 gigahertz to 110 gigahertz. This is a fully vector um, uh, load pole setup. Um, you know, probably one of its kind in the world. Uh, you know, you could do again fundamental. You know, pre-matching high VSWR. You could do fundamental from like 28 to 110 gigahertz. You could do some waveform engineering. So you see that the positioners here move the entire uh, test set. Uh, that that's actually an external test set in this case. And uh, you know, it's it's a very advanced system. It's well integrated with with the the microscope. It actually goes between so and it connects directly to the probe tip. So this is just an example. And Another example here. Okay, so again, uh, I won't go too too deep in here. I want to you know, give Andre a bit of time here. Uh, we're already thirty minutes into it, but uh, basically, you know, there, there's you know people use it in different ways. There's a you know the, the typical scalar setup where again you have your two tuners that are connected there. You have an input block where you could basically just calibrate out the loss of the input block and the coupling. Uh, path of the the coupler and that's how you you can de-embed back to the probe tip same thing on the output you there's different paths you can take either just an output path from the bias t to the to the uh, coupler or if you're using a spectrum analyzer to measure harmonic power and whatnot you can also uh, couple that so how do we calibrate this tuners in, in, in this case? Because you know people are, are more familiar with the you know the low frequency where in the low frequency you could actually calibrate the tuners uh, separately and uh, then because you know let's say the tuner the, the low frequency tuners are a bit bulkier so some people might just say no I just want to calibrate there but I'm gonna add a cable from the tuner to the probe tip and if I want to swap out the cable from time to time I can do that and I don't affect tuner calibration but at high frequency you, you can't really do that so what we do is we have an in situ calibration so what we do is we do a coax calibration of the cables and then you connect it uh, to the tuner and then we do a TRL measurement so well, the goal there is to basically de-embed the losses of the input tuner and the output tuner and which we call connector A connector B and basically when we calibrate the low tuner we can de-embed the source tuner and vice versa and this is how we're able to do a calibration with the, 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 the tuners uh, you know in situ uh, already connected to the probe tips. So, and then on the left, again, the last step is to do a power calibration. So what we do is we have, again, the connector B there that we uh, basically de-embed and we could do a power calibration at the DUT reference plane by de-embedding the cone B and measuring with the power meter uh, on, on the right there. And on the right, you basically have the full uh, vector receiver uh, set up with the couplers and uh, direct directly connected to the receivers of the PNAX. So this is a fully uh, vector corrected um, uh, low pull system. Again, uh, we have multiple bands from like 10 to 67. We're actually for IMS. We were going to promote also a new uh, new band. We'll, we'll you'll be here for that. But basically, the goal was to go lower in frequency. So stay tuned for more information on that. And again, the, the ultimate goal here is what is a match verification. So in load pool, the way to verify the system is pretty straightforward. So, you know, you, we do what we call a, a wave cal or a vector cal uh, after we do the tuner cal. And we need to be able to tune the tuners on the source and the load at con match conjugate impedances and get a power gain and transducer gain that is very low. So here you can see that the gamma that we're presenting from zero to 0.8. So I think this is probably, you know, this is uh, Su uh, Suhas that probably did this measurement. This is probably like at 28, 30 gigahertz. So what we're doing is we're doing uh, load pull on the source. So we're changing the source impedance and the load impedance. And we're measuring what the power gain and transducer gain is for all those impedances. And this needs to be very low. So I remember historically, you know, so I would see engineers would have 0.5 gamma and a match verification of 0.7. And they were happy with that. Here we're, you know, the, and these are actually the one of the first, you know, measurements we're doing. Now we've been uh, kind of tweaking some calibrations and, and and optimizing a few things, but this is the the kind of uh, match verification we we should expect at a, at a minimum. So here the worst case is about 0.2 dB at 0.8 gamma. So uh, you know, these, so now you know that when you get you know, performances like that, you know, your, your S parameter measurements are good, your tuna calibrations are good, and all the de embedding is right. And, you know, this is the kind of, of uh, performance you should expect from, uh, from a system like this. So uh, now I guess I'll hand it off to uh, Andre here. So I guess, Suhas, you can let me just stop sharing here. Andre, you still there, or did I lose you? Oh, I'm here. 
Oh, good, good. <laughs> so, very, very nice start. <laughs> All right, can you hear me well? Yeah, perfect. Very well. Let me take uh, from here, and uh, the last uh, part of our webinar, we will be talking about uh, wafer level calibration, what are the specific problems and uh, available solutions today. Before I start, I would like to drag your attention to a probably a very simple concept, but still sometimes uh, not really well understood in the practice. And in fact, all the RF measurements that we do are the results of the mathematical data post-processing, which means that before we see a parameter of our device under test, we need to do several measurements uh, in advance, like calibrate our system and uh, correct um, calibration um, systematic measurement errors and uh, define them and, and embed our device under test from the measurement setup, which means that uh, the data consistency and data repeatability where we were talking about this already and Vince pointed a couple of times becomes very, very uh, important. So the key success factor uh, when we do uh, odd wafer measurements is repeatability and reprodu reproducibility of our data. And the, the contributing factors to this success are, the first of all, the RF probes, of course. This is the physical interface to our device under test which connects uh, the measurement setup to the DUT terminals. Then also uh, system mechanical characteristics. If you have a good probes but the loose system and you cannot position uh, the probe at the same point of contact uh, every time you need to measure uh, your device under test, uh, this will significantly reduce the accuracy of your measurements and accuracy of your calibration. And the system positioning accuracy is usually given by uh, the system design, the optical system resolution, the stability of the positioners, the stability of the probe arms, the cables you use. This is all in total. It's actually, it sounds very simple, but there is a lot of expertise and understanding behind the system, uh, which provides you with a stable and repeatable data. Uh, so then, uh, calibration, uh, the accuracy of, uh, of planar calibration standards uh, becomes an influencing factor. Uh, so with the frequency, uh, the pre-knowledge of calibration standards changes, and we may have a good stable calibration results uh, very well uh, to understand and the low frequencies, and it becomes uh, very difficult to understand at the higher frequencies. And calibration algorithms. We have uh, multiple calibration algorithms developed today, and all of them have uh, the advantages and disadvantages. Why do we have so many calibration algorithms? The first of all, it's easy way to look at the calibration algorithms is that to split them into uh, major groups. One of them is so-called uh, straight calibration methods, which uh, do not allow us any um, uh, uh, freedom in uh, calibration standard electrical models. So it's just direct uh, calibration like SOLT, SOL, uh, or quick, uh, quick SOLT, where we need to know electrical characteristics of every calibration standard. Advanced calibration method, in contrast to the first group, it gives us uh, some more freedom in uh, electrical characteristics of, of uh, one or another calibration standard. And uh, in this case, you know, the real art um, and the key success uh, for the application people is to choose the right calibration algorithm, which is less sensitive to a particular set of problems that we have on our measurement setup and uh, shows the best calibration advantage because it uh, um, addresses the problems in the best way. Uh, when we do the system uh, calibration for load pole measurements, as Vince already mentioned, we have multiple types of the calibration we have to execute and go through. And uh, this is the calibration to the, uh, usually to the cable end, uh, which we uh, typically use to calibrate and uh, characterize the impedance tuners. And then also, uh, this is the in-situ cal or on wafer calibration, which uh, we need to do to move the reference plane uh, to the probe tip end. When we do, uh, uh, cable and uh, calibration uh, or cal calibrate our system for the clock cell measurements, we use a set of um, uh, calibration kit. It's well-defined calibration standards. We know the electrical characteristics defined by the vendor. Uh, the standards is easy to operate. You connect them to the end of the cable and uh, we have a very reliable uh, calibration results, in particular when we use the top ranges. Uh, when we uh, move to the wafer level measurements, uh, actually uh, the, the situation changes completely. Uh, in one of my previous presentations, I mentioned that you basically fall into the rabbit holes like an Alice and uh, everything uh, is flips upside down and I still have this, the, same, uh, the same feeling uh, uh, when we do the on wafer cal. Uh, 
Uh, well, this problem was uh, first identified for the engineers when they start uh, doing the first uh, repeatable measurements of a planar devices all the way back, back to 1975. Uh, uh, Hewlett Parker uh, did the first uh, the pioneer in this area and did the first millimeter measurements up to three gigahertz frequency range. Then the technology uh, was rapidly developed and the first uh, commercially available probes uh, became available uh, late 80th. Uh, so over this over 40 years uh, development of the wafer level measurements, uh, the technology made significant, actually tremendous uh, um, uh, progress. And today we are able to do the wafer level measurements and the frequencies beyond one terahertz. This is really amazing. Uh, the set of the challenges and the problems that we need to deal with uh, when we do on wafer measurements also changed uh, with the technology development of the probes. Some of them became irrelevant or less relevant because we found the solutions for them. Uh, some others became more relevant today, more dominant, and engineers are working, still working on the solutions with them. Here I will give you uh, several examples of them and we will go through uh, one by one. For instance, uh, uh, like a probe contact uh, visibility and repeatability of the measurement data related with uh, uh, bad visibility of the probes. Uh, that was relevant for the first generation of the wafer level probes and uh, for today's generation it becomes significantly less relevant and for some probes even irrelevant at all. A symmetry of the measurement standards when we do wafer level measurement we, we usually measure port one and port two standards uh, at once and standards are represented by two physical elements like pair open, open pair of short and pair of loads and uh, if you cannot position the probes on the standard accurately, uh, your uh, standard electrical characteristic becomes symmetrical. That was a big problem for the uh, beginning of the on wafer measurement uh, history, and today it becomes relevant because uh, engineers found a very good solution. Uh, impedance of, of the planar calibration standards, uh, first uh, to characterize the equivalent impedance of the first planar standards was very difficult. Uh, people had difficulty to understand what is the equivalent impedance of the load, uh, how to measure characteristic impedance of the transmission line. Uh, but today we believe that uh, we know how to do it. We are, we, there is a lot of work already completed and its problem becomes less relevant. Uh, what we deal with today as a set of the problems is how to uh, debat um, and how to get rid of device infrastructure like pads and interconnects. It was less relevant in the past because devices were large and measurements frequency was um, uh, below a few gigahertz. As today, uh, for sub-targets measurements, it becomes a very big problem. Device and the test is far away from, uh, from the probe tip. And also uh, today, because we have a uh, laboratory spread over the globe, uh, globe and uh, we ship the wafers back and forth, uh, defining the measurement, uh, understanding the measurement uncertainty and defining measurement uncertainty for wafer level measurements because, uh, becomes uh, very important problem and specifically relevant when we do wafer level measurements at millimeter wave frequencies. So let me uh, review uh, um, these problems one by one. Probe contact repeatability and visibility for the first uh, generation of wafer probes commercially available like WPH for cascade microtech. Uh, it was very hard to define uh, the electrical point of contact because it was basically hidden by the probe, uh, by the, uh, probe structure. Yeah, so which means that achieving a reliable and repeatable contact uh, was purely on the operator's shoulders. So experienced operators could get reliable measurements, unexperienced operators uh, couldn't get reliable and repeatable measurements out of the uh, measurement system. And uh, 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 this fact uh, caused another uh, problem uh, like an asymmetry and electrical characteristics of the, of the calibration standards. With the new generation of wafer probes, um, as an example showed here, when we have a 3D structure of the, uh, of the contact tips, uh, the point of contact is as uh, same visible as uh, for DC uh, measurements. So we, you can clearly see uh, the point of electrical contact under the microscope and you can uh, locate the probe and the desired uh, position of the contact pad and do it at any time you want to probe the device on the test or you touch down the calibration substrate. So it's uh, alignment of the probe is very easy and thus uh, repeatable and reproducible results are very easy to achieve. In fact, for the new generation of the probes, you even don't need to use the uh, alignment uh, structures. Um, so uh, repeatability of the contact is another point, uh, another important uh, uh, mechanical characteristic of RF probes, in particular when we do low pool measurements because as uh, Vince already mentioned, uh, uh, we need to stay in contact for the long time uh, and uh, because the tuner is, tu uh, tuner is operating, changing the load impedance and source impedance. So uh, the capability of the probe to provide uh, uh, 
stable contact uh, resistance over the long time uh, when being in contact and on a very uh, difficult uh, material, weapon visitation material such as uh, aluminium is a key uh, characteristic for the load pool measurements. And for the probes, which have a nickel alloy uh, tips, uh, it's possible to achieve very stable contact resistance over uh, the long time in contact and also over the uh, number of touchdowns like what you can see here is uh, the contact resistance is exactly the same uh, up to 1 million touchdowns. A symmetry of the of the standard impedances we talked about uh, it uh, previously so basically the asymmetry of the impedance of the pairs standard uh, standards is um, the root source for that is the probe placement problem. If we fix the probe placement problem, then actually the uh, asymmetry of uh, the standard impedances uh, goes away. Uh, for the first solution, because it was not possible uh, to predict the contact position and the, uh, of, of the first probes, engineers came up with a, a very smart idea. Uh, they did a lot of experiments and they realized that actually a symmetry of the load stand becomes uh, more important because the load defines the reference impedance of our calibration if the load is symmetrical and have different uh, load impedance for one and for two, my uh, accuracy of the calibration uh, significantly reduces. Open and short, uh, asymmetry is still important, but uh, maybe less important than, uh, than the asymmetry of the load. And uh, that is why they introduced the LRM calibration routine, which measures only one load and at the same time it measures the pair of the open and the short. Uh, good solution uh, for the first measurements uh, at the low frequencies, but uh, still didn't answer the question of um, what to do with the symmetry of the open and short uh, standard, as well as how to measure accurately of the second network analyzer port, which was not calibrated using the load, uh, the load standard. And it's uh, very good to, uh, to know that with the new prop technologies and with the new systems, uh, which provide a very accurate prop positioning, actually this problem does not really exist any longer. Uh, impedance of Kaplan standards, uh, it's another problem we, uh, we mentioned. Um, what we can see here on this graph is, that, is where the frequency increase, it, uh, it becomes uh, very difficult to provide an accurate model which captures um, characteristics of our uh, open, short, and load standards at the higher frequencies. Uh, here, uh, we look at the phase uh, of the open and short standard accurately measured and, uh, and uh, compared with the uh, traditional models that we use for the open and short, such as a parallel capacitance and serial inductor. What we can see is that this model apply very well uh, up to roughly 40 gigahertz and beyond 40 gigahertz, uh, they actually fail, which means that the standard uh, the calibration methods which require accurate models for the open and short will fail as well, now, such as an SOLT. And here is a very interesting example of measurements of a uh, coplanar of webguide line embedded on the wafer after the proactive calibration uh, corrected by uh, a sole T up to 110 gigahertz with an accurate model of open, short, and load and inaccurate model, just a standard uh, model provided by the vendor. What we can see here is that if we do some additional uh, uh, exercises and characterize the standard uh, open and short and load accurately, uh, we can significantly increase uh, the accuracy of the SLT, even SLT calibration up to and push it up to 110 gigahertz. However, uh, this is not always practical um, and that is why engineers prefer uh, to use the methods which are uh, less sensitive to electrical characteristics of uh, standards like an open and short and millimeter wave frequencies such as LRM, TR, uh, TRL, LRM, TMR, TMRR. R stays for the open and short, uh, which uh, do not really need to be modeled accurately. Uh, so with the uh, frequency increase, uh, we have to do a little bit more than just the probe tip calibration. What you can see here on the slide is that uh, when we use the probe tip calibration standards, our reference plane uh, of our measurements is shifted to the probe tip. But our device under test is actually located far from the probe tip. And this picture gives us a very good comparison of uh, real uh, geometrical sizes for the device under test. So where you can see the contact pads are much, much larger uh, than, uh, than the device under test itself. And uh, uh, the probe tip uh, is not just the only step that we need to exercise. We need to do uh, some extra steps like an, uh, pad embedding routines. So and shift the reference plane down to the device and the test terminals. So from the probe, uh, from, uh, from the probe tip uh, and get rid of uh, the impact of the device contact pads as well as the VSTAC and other device and the test infrastructure. 
So uh, this algorithm, so the embedding becomes uh, very difficult uh, to uh, execute at the frequencies beyond 20 gigahertz. Industry conventionally uses an open and short de embedding, which uh, captures device, uh, uh, device under test infrastructure uh, environment uh, pretty accurately, but only up to the 20 gigahertz. If you need to verify extracted models, uh, model parameters at the frequencies beyond 20 gigahertz, it becomes very, very challenging. So we need to use either advanced embedding methods, which require multiple steps, uh, five or seven embedding steps uh, are available today, but they are really impractical. Uh, so the alternative way is to move from the prop tip calibration and the bad calibration elements on the wafer. So there's a custom on wafer calibration standards and that shows uh, actually very good um, calibration accuracy and measurement accuracy results. And this is the, uh, the way to go. Different calibration methods are available. Multi-line TRL for much higher frequencies, uh, which is actually frequency unlimited, or uh, if customers prefer, engineers prefer to use the prop tip calibration, this is through much reflect or uh, through much reflect reflect. Why uh, through much reflect or through much reflect reflect uh, calibration algorithms uh, are more uh, preferable for the wafer level measurements? The first of all is because they do measurement, they measure uh, both load standards, port one and port two load, independently from each other. So the system is fully calibrated with the loads. Uh, and the symmetry of the load is allowed. This is a typical case when we uh, make only for calibration standards when you have uh, one uh, stock um, so parasitic of the stock on the port one and another parasitic of the stock uh, via stock on the port two. So they basically the custom made load is asymmetrical. And arbitrary impedance models are also a load. So the load can be uh, an arbitrary impedance element uh, with uh, even the load resistance port one, port two different from each other, which typically corresponds to on wafer uh, calibration, custom calibration standards. So this algorithm is on wafer ready. It has an additional advantage versus already known transfer through much reflect algorithm. Uh, in fact, uh, this algorithm has an extra uh, reflect element. So you can measure both opens and both shorts. It adds some additional information redundancy uh, on the algorithm. So the algorithm itself becomes more robust uh, to, to the errors and improves the consistency and reproducibility of the measurements. So uh, next slide shows uh, a comparison of a conventional you know, wafer level calibration routines like LRM, uh, TMRR, uh, L, uh, LRM, and T TMRR uh, uh, in terms uh, of the standards which are used. So through load port one, load port two, uh, short port one, short port two, open port one, uh, open port two. What we can see here is that through my flat or flat, use all possible standards uh, for the uh, additional redundancy of the measurements. Uh, by using uh, two opens and two short standard, uh, it's the best accuracy uh, for uh, when measuring highly reflective devices located in the both uh, edges of the Smith chart, left and right. And by using the two, star uh, two load standard, uh, we have the best um, uh, accur uh, accuracy for measuring well matched devices, like transmission lines or the power amplifiers. With the frequency increase beyond uh, uh, and reaches uh, millimeter, semi-millimeter wave uh, ranges, we have uh, actually a couple of other problems that we need to, uh, to deal with. And in particular, this is the uh, multi-mode propagation and uh, the coupling uh, couple of wave structures like a traditional um, calibration substrate uh, supports higher other modes um, in the coupling of wave guide transmission lines and, and standards if you rest it on the metal chuck. Uh, this is the picture shows us the, uh, the electromagnetic wave uh, structure um, at 110 gigahertz uh, when the calibration substrate is placed on the metal chuck. What you can see here is that uh, the waves are completely corrected because uh, these are the result uh, they are the result of the superposition of uh, different modes uh, and higher modes are not desired. Uh, for the uh, for the calibration, yeah. So uh, this problem uh, became uh, mm, the engineers became aval uh, aware of this problem uh, already at the measurements of 20 and 40 gigahertz, and uh, uh, the solution that uh, engineers uh, used previously was to uh, isolate the uh, calibration substrate uh, from the impact of the metal chuck. So by adding an absorber layer in between. Uh, so this solution works pretty well up to roughly 50 gigahertz, but what you can see here with the frequency increase, uh, absorber changes the characteristic impedance of the transmission line and increases the imaginary part of the transmission line. Basically what happens is that the millimeter wave frequencies we, we, we end up with a, a calibration reference impedance uh, of a complex nature. And this is not what we actually want, want to do. 
Uh, the alternative approach is uh, not to isolate the calibration substrate uh, uh, from the, uh, of the, the impact of the chuck, but to make the chuck itself uh, from the matched uh, material. The ceramic, uh, which, is, uh, which has the same director constant as the calibration substrate. Uh, the first experiments which were done back to uh, 2008 uh, proved that this concept actually works pretty well. And the main idea is that not to absorb the electromagnetic waves, but just let them uh, dissipate into the, into the uh, auxiliary chuck and make it infinite uh, of size uh, versus the geometry of calibration substrate. And uh, this idea was already proven by the uh, planner Carl uh, Industri Industrial Consortium uh, of European uh, meteorologists and engineers. Uh, so uh, if we want to do the accurate uh, calibration of uh, using coplanar structures at frequencies beyond 50 gigahertz, it's better to look at the material properties uh, of the main chuck and the calibration uh, and auxiliary side. Uh, of the chuck. So um, another um, probably what happens is uh, with the frequency increase is that uh, it, it becomes very difficult to define um, equivalent impedance of planar calibration standard when it is located at the probe tip. Uh, why it is so? Because the probe tip is the discontinuity point where uh, electromagnetic waves are not formed properly and uh, it's always very difficult if you have a superposition of electromagnetic waves uh, to define the equivalent impedance of the standard uh, to which mode do you define it? Uh, so we actually don't know. Uh, and what you can see on this graph is that the coplanar wave wet line uh, mode is, uh, pure, is uh, well formed only at a distance uh, far from the transition point. Uh, uh, this graph shows as a result of extracting um, load inductance out of the, the planar load, uh, the probe tip load standard, the frequencies uh, beyond 110 gigahertz. What we can see is that actually equivalent inductance of the load is not constant and it varies uh, from frequency point to frequency point, and uh, there are several ranges where it varies really drastically, and we have the error up to uh, actually 95%, which means that if uh, we use this standard and we use this model, uh, we end up with a, a very large error of our proactive calibration. Uh, the possible solution for this problem is that uh, they use the standard which are located far away from the transition point, uh, which means that SOLT, SOLR, LRM, LRM methods uh, are probably not desired uh, when using the probe tip calibration standards and frequencies, uh, millimeter wave frequencies. Uh, so either uh, using the um, offset calibration standards or what is the always better way is uh, just simply go directly to the um, to the old wafer calibration standards where your probe and transition point is uh, far away from the physical location of the standard. And the standards are very close to the device and the terminals. And the bonus you can, uh, you can have with this approach is that you get rid of the parasitics of your device and the test infrastructure. Uh, how to address the problem of the um, metrological level uh, calibration accuracy and as well as how to calculate um, um, and to propagate the uncertainties of your, um, of your proactive calibration. It's possible to do when we use um, calibration algorithms and calibration software developed by metrologists. Uh, one of them is uh, statistical uh, free software package developed by National Institute of Standards and Technologies available for everyone. The only limitation here is that you need to be a metrology expert to know how to operate the software and uh, uh, to know how to set it up and use it uh, for, um, for the calibration. And also you cannot connect it directly to the network analyzer. This is the tool which was developed for the data post-processing. So you cannot calibrate your lab setup and do s parameter load for measurements uh, with this type of the calibration. Uh, uh, we suggest to use uh, Calibri calibration software, which is also uh, free of charge, free downloadable uh, from the NPI web uh, page. Uh, it, it, connects this uh, uh, statistical calibration engine with the graphical um, user interface of Calibria and uh, yeah, makes the um, very complicated calibration routine uh, very easy to use and implement in the daily, uh, and the daily uh, calibration practices. And last but not least, uh, this is the online calibration, which means that uh, Calibria measures the S parameters of uh, calibration standards. And also once the error terms are calculated by statistical, Calibria sends them back to the network analyzer. So you, you can calibrate the entire uh, setup for your life measurements, just uh, uh, operating. One, uh, one software graphical user interface. The last slide is um, a compare, uh, just 
the demonstration of what is possible to do uh, using Calibri statistical calibration here is in the measurements of the LNA, the frequency range from 220 up to 340 gigahertz uh, on the way. Um, at the way, this is the LNA from Fraunhofer and Freiburg, uh, very, very good technology. And what we can see here is that we were able to characterize not only the gain of this LNA, but also to estimate uh, the confidence interval, which makes the uh, transfer of the measurement results uh, from one setup to another setup much, much easier. Yeah, so, and this is all possible to do just with one software, uh, like Calibria and NIST. Um, uh, statistical. So we, we have an application note uh, dedicated to this topic. Uh, feel free to uh, go to the API webpage and download this uh, application note. And this is my last slide. Uh, it looks like a pretty good in time. Uh, it's, uh, instead of the conclusion, I wanted to share with you a table which may help you uh, to make the right choice uh, of the calibration method, depending on uh, what you exactly do and what is your ultimate goal. Uh, so here you have a list of the pop popular calibration methods uh, applicable for the wafer level uh, system calibration and different application scenario that like appropriate calibration, on wafer calibration with the uh, custom standards, uh, measurements of the millimeter wave frequencies, measurements of subterranean uh, frequencies, uh, when we do the highly refractive device characterization or when we do the wrong device characterization. And the check marks help you to understand advantages or uh, limiting factors of each of the calibration method. So thank you very much. This is all about the uh, uh, calibration I wanted to share with you today.